Welcome to the Not So Common Podcast with Pat Contry. That's me. This week, I'll be speaking with Mark Bussler from Classic Game Room. Now, Mark is one of the pioneers of retro game reviews online, starting in the late 90s and then continuing on, starting about 2007 on YouTube, and he's been very successful. So we haven't really spoken before, so this is a great opportunity for us to sort of banter about and talk about the retro gaming scene and, you know, sort of just pick each other's brains. So enjoy this conversation with Mark Bussler. Well then, we're, we're going to dive into this one because it, this should be interesting as I am literally, for the first time, speaking, uh, not in, I guess kind of in, per, like in person in the modern way, we're, we're virtually speaking, uh, with, uh, with, with internet personality and writer, Pat Contry. Using both of those terms very loosely. And I am with Mark Bussler uh, of Classic Game Room, one of the longest running retro uh, video game YouTube shows. And even before that, I believe starting in the late 90s. So Mark's been around the block quite a bit. Didn't mean it like that. Thanks, but Pat. Gr- great to finally talk to you. Are, you are elusive because unlike a large chunk of the retro gaming community on YouTube that show up to conventions, I don't think I've ever seen you at a convention or have heard of you even attending one, which is pretty rare for someone of your stature. You have, uh, you know, like 400,000 YouTube subscribers, and I would think that you would show up every now and then. <laughs> I, I'd love to, actually. I think I think where I, uh, probably 10, 15 years younger, you, you couldn't keep me away, but um, <laughs> unfortunately, all the convention stuff got, uh, got big as I got... Uh, a little bit older and have some other real life commitments that are much harder to walk away from. <laughs> and uh, I go to the ones that are in, in I'm from Pittsburgh, so there's a couple uh, in Pittsburgh every year. And I've been to the one in Boston, but unfortunately it's just it, that the uh, travel is travel's not as easy as it used to be. Oh, real life commitments, friends, families, babies, who needs them, right? You gotta, but if you can come out to one in your area, somewhat your neck of the woods, I'm not sure where exactly in Pennsylvania you are, but the one outside of Philly, too many games in June, is a really good one to attend. It's very big. I've heard of that, that one. one. Yes, uh, uh, actually, I, it usually takes place during a weekend. That I'm not able to do it. <laughs> the oh, time, well, there you the, go. The timing. I, I think I just one I'm looking into because that that's in Philly, right? Or it's re- it's about 45 minutes outside of Philly. Yeah, so basically Philly. Yeah, that's that, that's one that's on my radar. But I think the scheduling has been a problem for that one. I do go to uh, uh, the the one in Pittsburgh. Sure. No, I'm, I'm drawing. So, a, oh, I don't know why I'm drawing a blank. The, 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 the Papa guys. The, the, uh, <laughs> the one. The, the one hosted by Papa. The Pittsburgh. The Pittsburgh one. They have I'm like not hundred, familiar with that one. I, I. My. My budget only allows one Pennsylvania uh, convention a year. No. Uh, I. I go to ones that that ask me to come out, and I guess I'm in the the good spot now where I have to actually turn some down, uh, which I couldn't imagine doing that five six years ago, where I actually would be turning down invitations to conventions. So I guess uh, I finally built some built up some cachet over the years. You've been uh, barely. Uh, your show's been around for a while now, and you've you've more than one too, because you're you're as as far as I know now. I keep hearing from people how good you are at podcasting. Well, and I, I, appreciate I can totally that. see that speaking to you now. You've got a better radio voice than me, so secretly I just I, I actually resent you. You, you, well, well, you're about a, a full three octaves lower than me, so I think you actually have the radio voice. <laughs> but you've got the clarity. Um, I just started oh, mumbling. What it is? <laughs> my, my father used to always complain how much I mumble. But then I would just say, hey, Dad, you just can't hear anymore. Um, I've been on YouTube since June 2008, and I started with the Pat the NES Punk videos. Um, and then I, uh, I branched off into the strangely popular flea market madness where... I literally had it on my hard drive for a year, and I'm like, why Why do people care about a guy who goes to a flea market? Little did I know that now that's like a huge genre yeah. that I helped pioneer at the time. I had no idea that it would, it would blow up to that thing. Well, then again, at the time, retro gaming collecting in 2009 wasn't nearly even 20% as big as it is now. I know. It was a lot cheaper, too, wasn't it? Uh, oh, absolutely. And it's all my fault and your fault, of course. I always love that sort of uh, <laughs> debate, the chicken or the egg. Uh, or, you know, Did people start collecting games because of YouTubers, or did YouTubers start doing videos on the old games because people were collecting them and playing them? And the answer is yes to both of that. I mean, it's you can't really separate the two. It's definitely the argue, internet, yeah. But I would argue that Vetrix games didn't, didn't start going up in value just because some people randomly... We're searching them out, or how do you randomly find a Vectrix game online and, and say, oh, I want to start collecting <laughs> for that system? I don't think that happens. I think people just find it on their own, and then at the same time, people create content for those systems and games. 
that's to me, I think, how this ecosystem has sort of evolved in my mind. Uh, Vect- I get blamed for Vectrex and Truxton quite a bit uh, for, for escalating <laughs> the prices on those. But I think it just it's so much of it has to do with the internet. And I think people just, it's so, it's so much easier now than it was 10 years ago, certainly 20 years ago, to just discover these, uh, these, these games you've never heard of or played before and discover people who like these games. And you talk with them and then you learn about new games. I mean, I've learned... 95% of what I know about video games at this point from the classic game room audience. So I have them sure. to thank. So, so it, you, you fed back into the system and they're feeding you and it's like, it's like a... Uh, Blame them. It's their fault. <laughs> I was going to say, it's not parasitic. It, 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 it's it's a, a sort of a feedback loop. Um, I, I, I've said time and time again that I got back into the NES and then collecting and playing again because of a website called TSR's NES Archive. Okay. A famous website that went defunct in the late 90s, I think around 2000, that there was so much knowledge on the website, you can still look it up, uh, just cataloging weird NES stuff like the NES M8 demo unit. Uh, there's the M8 and 82. I knew about the 82 as a kid, the M8 I never heard of, talking about Color Dreams games and Wally Bear and the No game, the famous anti-drug game, uh, and all the Bible games. You are this way that- beyond me on my NES knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's okay. You probably got me on, a, on an Atari and probably Sega. Um, <laughs> but it was just opening up your mind to, you know, here's a system where I loved as a kid that I probably only knew literally maybe through Nintendo Power and through friends and through renting games. I maybe only had seen pictures of, played, or had heard of maybe 20 to 30% of the library. You know, maybe 250 games. Now, all of a sudden, you have this internet and you have emulators uh, like Nesticle was the big one in the late 90s. Um, it opens up this entire world of, of games you had no idea existed before. And that was fascinating so much to me that I went out to Funko Land and bought an NES again. And I went out and started going to the flea markets again in the late 90s. So it's sort of a 20-year uh, venture and trek and loss of you know tens of thousands of dollars to sort <laughs> of uh, you know get that nostalgic feeling back. I, I definitely want to talk about your book, uh, which, by oh, we'll the get- way, is seriously <laughs> impressive. Thank and you I so thought, much. And I thought about the, I don't know why I was having a brain fart earlier, but the, the, the wonderful convention in Pittsburgh is Replay Festival, or Replay FX. Replay uh, FX, okay. It's still reasonably new, and uh, I've, 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 uh, this is where I filmed all my uh, pinball videos over the years. Um, they have so many games, they have like hundreds, 400 arcade games, or 500, and then like 500, 600 pinball machines, and it, since it's a reasonably new convention, it's, it's, it's growing every year, but you can still get on the games. You're saying there's 400 arcade machines and 500 pinball machines? Yeah, they take up the entire uh, convention center in Pittsburgh, which is a major, huge, like they hosted the G20 there one year or something. I mean, this is a big-ass convention center. So it's mainly arcade games first and maybe console secondary then? They have a huge console section um, off to the side. Uh, most uh, you, you walk in and it's, it's sort of like PAX, but, not, but you can actually walk through it. Um, sure. You know, so they have um, just, you, know, you just, you're just bombed with all these arcade games and they're in just beautiful condition. I know actually got the, they, they work with the, one of the guys I've had help tune my machines. Uh, so they're, they're in great shape, and then, then of course, you know their their main thing is pinball. So, boy, if you want to play a pinball machine, that's the place to go. And I, anyway, I can't speak highly enough of that show and just them <laughs> uh, in general. Uh, this year, it's July twenty seventh to thirtieth. We'll just plug it real quick. They have a cornhole competition as well, which I think is funny. Um, it's listed. On this that's site. like a normal thing in Pennsylvania. You Californians are laughing at in, our cornhole. Not as big as New Jersey. Uh, New Jersey with all the Ginzans. Uh, you had uh, bocce ball uh, at all, all the Italian American clubs, or uh, just regular horseshoes for the most part. Not really cornhole as much. Where are you uh, from, there. Pat? I'm from New Jersey. But are you in California now? I am in, in sunny San Diego. I moved out here August 2009. Okay, I thought you were in. I, I love San Diego. I'm, I'm very jealous. I, 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 you, so you have like the best taquitos and avocados, and then the best weather in the world out there. Uh, it, it used to be the best weather. I'm not sure with the climate change. I don't want people to yell at me for that. But it's still, yeah, it's, it's the best weather in the U.S. I mean, it just is. I mean, today it was like, you know, 55 degrees. Then again, I hear from people, yeah, it's 70 degrees today in Chattanooga, Tennessee. But we won't get on those topics on this on this podcast. It was 70 um, uh, in Pittsburgh just a week ago, which is, by yeah. the way, which is kind of alarming. But Yeah, it's normal, though, right? Yeah, it's just normal. Don't worry about it. It was good um, for walking. <laughs> 
we're, we're as Bill Burr says, we're in the golden age of climate change, right before it gets bad. Like, oh, enjoy it. Enjoy the sunny days in, in winter. Well, the problem uh, the, is all of the NES games uh, hold the Earth's heat in. So oh, what, what, what you is? need to do is you need to play Nintendo and unleash unleash the um, the power uh, the, the the yeah that thing. That's, that's <laughs> it's science. You, you play Fire Nice and sort of bring a balance to it. Oh, Fire Nice! That's an esoteric NES title, the, the <laughs> sequel to Solomon's Key. There you go. I'm not going to um, go head to head with you on NES knowledge. Oh, this isn't a competition. I just want to. No, there's, there's you, the only <laughs> things I really know about NES. Um, because I, because I, I, the NES was my game system of choice for re, a relatively short time span, but uh, I want to say it was from like sixth grade, no, probably more like seventh grade through some part in eighth grade when I eventually you know, turned into Sega Genesis fanboy, Mark. But yeah. Contra, Bionic Commando, Blaster Master, the, the Top Gun, and uh, those are my games. Uh, those three, three out of those four I had as a kid, I meant Blaster Master. I love, love Blaster Master. I still love those games to this day. Great games. Ikari Warriors 2. Yeah, I loved your your book was great, man. Just so much knowledge in that. So much knowledge, so much uh, wasted uh, letters and words that no one ever read. I mean, how many how long did that take you to make your book? And what first of all, for, for for listeners who may not know the title of Pat's book, Pat, what's what's your book called? Wow, that's that's a you put that plug right in a T for me. The I'm ultimate my... NES guide to intergalactic destruction. That'll be the sequel. It's Ultimate Nintendo Guide to the NES Library, 1985 to 1995, and it encapsulates the... Uh, it focuses on the North American NES Library, but also includes the PAL exclusives as well, and the HGS Australian exclusives. There's also an accompanying app called Ultimate Game Guide for NES, available on iOS and Android devices. And that's uh, not the book itself, but it has a lot of the book's information and has filters and search tools and tips and codes for games. A lot of stuff you can't get in a book uh, of that size. And uh, it, it, I worked on it on and off for three years, but in terms of real hard work, well over two years, probably two and a half years it, of it, hard work. It's 600 and some pages. 439. No, isn't, it more than, isn't it more than 600? No, it's not. I, 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 I would know because I... <laughs> Maybe I was I seeing the, double that day. I was like, it's a giant ass book. I have it on. It's on the. It review. is giant. Now maybe maybe you confuse because it weighs over six pounds. Maybe that's what it is. So that's in your head. I, I definitely it, it, looked at the number during. I, I don't have it here in my in my office, but I, it's it's over in the studio. In I think fact, it's, I just, I was just editing. Um, I thought you'd enjoy this. I was I was actually wrapping up editing today of uh, of a film I'm working on uh, the the giant review of Musha. We were joking yeah, about. Th so this was a uh, part of a, a Kickstarter you did. Where tell me about this Kickstarter for for this Musha epic film. What is what's involved with that? I'll tell you that in a moment. But in the background of this one shot where I'm playing the game, I look over my shoulder and there's your name, because the book is on the shelf and it's just so freaking big, you can't miss it. So so Pat's book is right next to the art of Atari on my shelf in the in the background of this one shot. So just just so you know, your name is your name is in the uh, is in the the film. So I owe you advertising dollars, is what you what you're saying? Well, uh, it, I am, I am promoting <laughs> Sega, and of course, bashing NES as much as possible. But oh, of course, absolutely. Would, you wouldn't expect any less from me. That this this is uh, I'm I'm creating a series. Um, in fact, the first it's almost done. I'm I'm actually just wrapping up the last couple shots now uh, of what I'm calling CGR feature reviews, which are like 90 minute uh, film length reviews that are just giant in depth huge uh just adventures through so how through so the game traditional... every layer of the game so we're talking about like step by step every level no. every boss every no it's, intricacy of the game it's sort of like a standard classic game room review times a thousand if that makes any sense uh, it's just a lot of just just in I don't want to say any words like in-depth analysis because there's no in-depth analysis whatsoever. It's like just diving into this game and having a great time with it, but then on peeling back every layer, like talking about the music. Like I, I go through naming the characters. I go through... Um, uh, if, now, in the case of Musha, I take players through the entire game and actually do a, uh, uh, a bit of a walkthrough on Musha, but then just have a great time the whole way through. I show people which Sega Genesis controllers are best to play the game with, and all the while... It's a bit of a um, parody where Edit Station 1 has me locked in video game purgatory and he's tormenting me by forcing me to play Musha until I beat it, which of course I then do beat it and then 
you know. Oh, he, I see. He you makes me the, do some MST other... 3K angle. <laughs> uh, it's it's it's. I mean, I love MST 3K. It's not. I wouldn't say it's a direct influence, but it's it's that level. It's that kind of enjoyment, but combined with the review that you can. It, it's meant to be like a sit down ninety minute adventure. Uh, and but, plus, it's not a, it's not a bad game. It's a game that you famously love. So. I have a bunch of these planned, and they're all on good games that I love that are maybe not serious mainstream games. Like, I'm looking... The next one is going to be Herzog's Y and the Genesis. The one after that is going to be Truxton. And then from there, I'm I'm looking at uh, Super Pac-Man, uh, Revenge of Shinobi. And I'm drawing a blank on what the other one was at the moment. But uh, there's a couple other ones I'm, I'm eyeing up from a few different game so, systems. Now you, but you famously do about a review a day, correct? So how does this interfere with that work? Or have you come into a nice group where you can do those daily reviews and then work on this on the side at the same time? I've slowed the reviews down. A lot. I used to be able to just lock myself in a room and do do more reviews. But as, uh, as, as YouTube has changed a lot over the years, unfortunately, that uh, business model has just uh, not... Um, worked for me anymore so i've moved away from uh concentrating on a review a day and just i do about three a week now okay uh which which are funded by the uh, the backers on patreon and I, I i put more into them so that they're just they stand out and that they're like really high production value reviews of typically super obscure and weird ass old games <laughs> uh, i think that's I, i'm writing a book right now on on how to make video game reviews and oh really part of it is to, part part of the my, my entire thought process on this is if you're going to do it now, you have to find your little niche and stand out. And what classic game rooms niche is, is high production value reviews of things nobody's ever heard of. And sure. the, only, the only way that concept can, can succeed is if the show goes beyond YouTube, which is uh, what I'm currently uh, pushing, and, and you, pushing it to do. And you've always sort of been, I, I think, trying to have your finger on the pulse of where YouTube is going in the industry. You famously left YouTube for a while <laughs> and then and then came back uh, when you thought it was either, I guess, safe. Maybe you can go into that. Um, and oh you my. also almost left doing videos entirely. Yeah. And then you put up the put up the Patreon and you had overwhelming uh, success with that and support. So I, I love to pick your brain on what went into both of those ideas. Uh, you know, why did you decide, okay, YouTube's no longer the place for me, and, and why did you come back to it? Well, Classic Game Room is, as far as I know, the longest-running video game review show in existence, uh, which started in November of 1999. So it's, I think it has survived cancellation at least two, maybe three times, depending on what, <laughs> where, where you look at cancellation. Um, but, I mean, you really have, in this, in this, in just the entertainment industry in general, and certainly in what we do, I think you really have to adapt to, to market trends or find new ways around them. And I think for a long time I've been trying to adapt. And in, uh, at the end of 2015, it was pretty much over adapting. And I just said, well, I will find a new way around this or else that's it. Uh, which it was is no a, longer feasible for you to do that as, as, as basically a, source of, a primary source of income at that point. No, I mean, with a 20-year 20 veteran in the production industry, I, I can no longer you know, put up a video and make $20 and be happy with it. I mean, that's just, that is not sustainable. Uh, it's a good part-time job. That's actually even like the whole point of my book, I think. It's just like, if you're going to do this kind of stuff, do it for fun. Be yourself, but don't go into it expecting to be PewDiePie because like, that's... That that you you may as well play the lottery. It's just changed so much. I think partly because I'm calling it the great like I, I use a reference in the book where I talk about I, I'm sure you're familiar with the never ending story. Sure. Um, and you know the nothing, which is like this swirling mass of nothing, which is um, absorbing what is it Fantasia or whatever it's called. Uh, well, in the case of YouTube, uh, you know you, you we'll, we'll 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 treat YouTube in this case like like it's Fantasia. YouTube is being absorbed by what I call the oversaturation, mm -hmm. and there is nothing that anyone is going to be able to do to stop the oversaturation. So you either find <laughs> a way out, or you just hunker down and try to survive. And I'm finding a way out personally because I, this, this it's. It is the Kobayashi Maru scenario from Star Trek Two. You either repro you either reprogram this computer or you're you're doomed. So, so at the end of 2015, when you when you were looking at like you said, there's there's no way out for me to continue doing this. Uh, what then you you had the great idea. Okay, let's see if my fans will support me on a Patreon. In your mind, did you have a sort of uh, probability of of success where you thought, okay, let's see what happens, or you thought, okay, this is it. I don't think this is going to happen. 
Uh, my, my YouTube career is basically over versus how it was. I mean, what were you thinking? Of? Were you worried, concerned? I was, I was uh, 15 was terrifying. Yeah, 14 and 2014 and 15 were very uh, <laughs> worrying years, to say the least. Um, you mentioned I'd left YouTube. I never actually said the words left YouTube. I think people tend to love to use that phrase. What I did was I pulled the show off of YouTube in 2013 after um, their automated copyright system came through and just... In the but, fall of 2013, yeah. Whatever it was, it just bombed like between between my channel at the time we were still growing the CGR Undertow channel. I mean, it just it just cleared out almost all of our high end, high earning videos. With the high earning videos all paid for the like, the weird Atari ones and stuff. So that was uh, kind of a problem for us. And then you know we we uh, some companies like Sega and Capcom were really cool about it. And we're like we we didn't have anything to do with this. We're really. We'll just go in and reverse these claims. You know, this isn't any of our doing. We love the promotion, mm -hmm. you guys. I, you know, I've worked with these companies for years. Then you get to Nintendo, and they're like, "No." It's like, <laughs> you're, but you're holding like 30 million views hostage right now on these videos. I have it's like some some of my best videos are like good re good reviews. Like I liked your, you know, like Mario Kart Seven. I love that game. Sure. And then all we got was, well, we don't have any, you know, whatever their PR departments like, we don't have anything to do with that. But we're not yeah, going that's... to do anything about that. And then. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I, we, I just and then YouTube was giving us no answers, and I said, like, you know what? This is. It had been kind of going downhill for a while anyway at that point, and I just tried to tried to. Um, we tried to launch a website, which is obviously much harder than it looks. That didn't work well, um, and there's just no good competitor to YouTube until now, when there is, but it's different because it's called Twitch, and it's eating YouTube's lunch. Uh, sure. I I think from my perspective. Uh, Twitch and YouTube will always be separate entities they in terms will. In, in, in terms of, of different sources of content. It's just what sort of content do you want? There will always be more finished, edited, I would say, um, higher quality content. And there always will be people that want the instant gratification uh, to go in their communities watching Twitch players. Uh, but yes, there's definitely a generational divide. Yeah, uh, there. The definitely. same way there's a the, the same way there's a generation generational divide between people that use Facebook versus Snapchat. You know, it's there's always going to be the new gadget, the new sort of source of media that comes around. And th there are some YouTubers that have embraced Twitch and have tried to split their time. I have not found that balance in terms of my work life where I could use Twitch besides for the NES marathon I do every year. Uh, besides that. Um, and I knew, you know, you probably have even stronger sort of ideas about that. But to me, the problem with Twitch, and I speak about it on my podcast from time to time, um, is that Twitch always has the draw and danger of becoming a full-time job, where <laughs> that's the only thing you can do. Like, what, what I think you and I have sort of seen the light about is that YouTube doesn't necessarily have to be 100% of our time drain no. in terms of what we do. You have a podcast. I now have two podcasts. Uh, you're you're doing a book. I've done a huge book. I have a plans for at least one more book uh, at this point. And other stuff on the side. I produce video game years on the side. Uh, YouTube, if, if unless you're the guy that has millions and millions of subscribers, where hell hell you can make uh, half a million a year or a million dollars a year, that's great. But for the rest of the people out there, uh, it has to be I think one of many cogs in your sort of uh, career wheel, yes, so to that, speak. You you've actually phrased that very well. Yeah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> that, that, you. You did a better job explaining that than I think I have. I, I've been trying oh. to, because in my mind, it's like YouTube is wonderful for marketing, but people don't like to think that they're being marketed to, but at the same time, you, but you have to look at it like, yeah, but I'm spending time making things here. So in a way, it's like, I love it. It's fun. The show has always been fun for what? me, but it has to act as marketing for like a book or a film. Well, it doesn't have to. I think that's sort of the perk benefits of uh, of doing free content online for five, six, seven, eight years, almost nine in my case, and, and uh, ten for years, I think, on YouTube. We're, we're about um, it. Actually, we started, uh, I think our shows started more or less the same. Re my, mine, mine was, I think I'm February of 08 on YouTube, but the channel started in seven, but we're, we're more or less neck and neck. Okay. So I, I think um, you you build up sort of a, another, I, I can't believe I'm saying the word cachet twice. I'm not even French. You build up the cachet of, I've done you know, thousands of hours of free entertainment. And so if you guys can handle me hawking a DVD every now and then or my or a certain NES guidebook, um, that that's what I got to do, uh, you know, a certain, in order a certain to keep NES going. guidebook, not a specific NES guidebook, just a, a certain a, one. A, uh, maybe the one that I wrote, maybe. maybe. Well, there's more <laughs> than one, but a certain NES guidebook, people know what I'm talking about. But 
Uh, I went to Comic Con, which, by the way, I had a Comic Con panel, and I was proud to get it last year. Uh, it was I one of the first uh, retro video game panels at Comic Con in San Diego, and I did it with uh, Andre Meadows of Black Nerd Comedy, Pixel Dan does uh, toy reviews, uh, James Rolf, you might have heard of him, and uh, Ian from the Completely Unnecessary Podcast as well. Um, but that aside, I've been up. Uh, at many seminars at Comic Con, and a lot of them were was was like basically how to market your writing, and I'll never forget this. I didn't put two and two together. This was about five years ago, where uh, you know, these are all famous writers on stage who've worked on. Uh, they've these guys have worked on like Star Trek series. They've done their own sci-fi books, and one guy just straight, straight out said, "You have to write uh, and make content for years." Uh, write and put out free content, and then once you have an audience, then then you have sort of a reputation and respect for good work. Then maybe you could market content or put out content that they think might have value. Oh my god! And I didn't Pat. I didn't put two two together until I was like, well, I've been doing free content online and putting in thousands of hours to make this content for years, and now now I'm doing DVDs. And now I'm doing my own book. I was like, okay, that makes perfect sense. And as long as you as long as what you're doing, I think, is quality content. I think people will respect that. It's not just a cash-in. It's not just like, I'm selling Pat the NES Punk socks to you. You may as well you know, if they're like, awesome socks, though. Sure. But you just see what I'm saying? It's, it's <laughs> not, I'm not marketing a product that my audience wouldn't necessarily enjoy. They would like an NES book, I would hope. You, you don't want to put what am out I doing? crap. Yes, yeah, I think it's yeah. I mean, everything you say is actually 100 percent true. And I, what you're but what you're doing is you are squashing the sense of entitlement. You mean it takes um, years to do? Th you mean it takes years? It's not instant success. That that is the one problem, and I don't like get into a generational thing because if you look at in terms of when I was born, I'm either the tail end of a millennial, or uh, or excuse me, the, the the first millennial or the tail end of Generation X. Because I guess Generation Generation Y doesn't exist anymore, but. <laughs> There, there, there's definitely why why became millennial I think anyway so but there there's definitely not uh, there's a small portion of people that scream the loudest about everything should be free because that's what they grew up with they grew up with uh, free content on YouTube they don't and, know anything else but it yeah but but I don't think you have you can dwell on that because there are always going to be people that say hey Pat why are you charging sixty dollars for a book that weighs six pounds and took you three years to make even though textbooks out there cost three hundred dollars when you went to college you know what I mean like. There, the people. There's some people that'll never get it. Yeah. The same people that uh, will, will say that, you know, software piracy is always okay, or stealing movies is always okay, uh, just because. And you can never, or, or using ad block is always okay, even though it might put websites <laughs> out of business. And you can never get around that. And you, you don't even, you can't even try and fight that. If people believe that, they believe that. You just have to go for the people that you think. Uh, think that a quality product is actually worth something and is a repayment for your time and effort. Because that's not just what entertainment is. It isn't just like, well, that CD costs you 20 cents to produce. What is the time that went into doing that? What is the knowledge I built up, the expertise, uh, and, and plus my own money that I invested into this project? What is that worth to you? I know from experience on this that they, your book, a $60 book for that, I, I, I think I have a rough idea of what that cost you to make. I'm pretty sure I know how much it costs you to ship that to uh, from your publisher. Um, <laughs> I, I believe you're using the same. You probably use the same printer that I used for one of my books. And then, then we'll, then we'll talk. On, of, we'll, we'll talk offline. <laughs> and and then on top of that, you've got like your time that goes into just coordinating shipping or whatever. It, it adds up fast. And pay, paying the writers, you know, uh, paying the people that do the artwork and all the cart graphics. Um, so, like I said, you can't really dwell on those, I'd say, 2% of people that bitch about it because they're never going to buy a product from you anyway. They no. wouldn't buy that product from me if it was uh, if it was half the price. I think you want to so, offer – I like the way you, – you phrased it well as, uh, with the wheel concept. I mean, you, I, I, at least – I think we're both doing more or less the same thing. We have multiple outlets – for our for for our creativity and, and and the gaming content and the love of gaming, I mean, I use the shows. I have like free versions of the shows, paid version of the shows, Amazon versions of the shows, different films on Amazon, the paid films, the books. Oh wow! I'm not. I haven't touched that Amazon thing yet. We're trying to get video game years on Amazon because video game years is sort of the best example for why YouTube is not for uh, I, TV high quality content uh, because video game years um, is a nice so prop. much time. It, some people say, uh, I remember Pro Jared tweeting out one time, this is the best show on YouTube that no one's watching, uh, which is a great compliment, but 
the problem is you can't recoup the cost that went into it. No. And, and not just the cost that we paid out to the editors, people that did the CG, the transitions, the, you know, the announcer. Mm -hmm. But uh, John and I, who co John Delia from Retroware, we co-produced it and co-directed. We didn't take a salary for that. So w instead of me working on my book at the time, back when I finished that up in like 2000 and oof, 14, I basically took a break from the book to work on that project for free. And each video gets like 20, 30,000 views. That's nothing no, in that's terms nothing. of revenue. I mean, that won't get you back 1% of what it costs to produce the show. So I think people have this sort of strange, weird sort of, they don't understand that. They'll just say, oh, Pat, you know, where's video game years? Why don't you do more? I can do that, but then I got to go back to doing an awful office job to support myself. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, that, they don't, hey, Pat, why don't you just do a Pat the NES Punk video, do them like once a week? Uh, even if I had the mental capacity to do that, to come up with the scripts and edit it <laughs> and do it, uh, I would be I would be gone. You wouldn't see me after two three months. That's just that's just how the world works. Well, where can listeners buy the video game years? Which but I was in the first couple of those. and They did turn out really well, by the way. And it was just funny because I was bringing up that was like the one of the first and last times I communicated with you via email. Um, <laughs> and I remember you did. I love your centipede segment you did. So I'm gonna go play it right now. It's fine. <laughs> I love doing that stuff. It was actually at the time. It's not like it is now where I could just throw in, throw an MOV file into a Dropbox. It was actually like very hard to like figure out how to go over my workflow and like take the tapes and like compress it and then somehow get it to you. And I just I remember at the time it was really very hectic and chaotic. Uh, and I think you wanted me to do more, and then I didn't get back to you. <laughs> And then I, I don't know. I, I heard from Dave Cross, and not too long, he's like, "Pat, the NES Punk's looking for you." I'm like, "Oh yeah, I haven't talked to Pat in years." <laughs> and um, so yeah, yeah. So, we so here we are. Yeah, there's there's people that dropped out. Um, but the good news is that if the show comes back, we did 82 through 89 to finish up uh, the Kickstarter. We didn't ask for nearly the amount of money that we should have. So unfortunately, there's, there might be some sticker shock if we come back and ask <laughs> money to do two or three more episodes. But uh, John and I have to get compensated for our time. We just have to because we don't get we yeah. can't put work towards other projects. And John has a full time job. But um, if we come back with that, we're going to incentivize. We're going to do it properly and pay everyone who speaks on screen at least. I'm not saying we're going to get you're going to get paid a thousand dollars to talk about you know the release of the Super Nintendo. But we're at least going to give you a small stipend. Wait, you're not going to pay me a thousand dollars to talk about Super Nintendo? Well, fuck that. <laughs> That's not a part of my my YouTube cog wheel, uh, my career wheel. Uh, but we're at least that I know try very little it. about Super Nintendo. <laughs> oh, okay. I know it's but, good. But we're we're at least going to do it uh, smarter the show, more efficiently. If if it comes back, and that's not a promise to your fans listening to your podcast. What's your podcast name? Uh, CGR twenty eighty five coming to you from the year twenty eighty five after Classic Game Room has defeated the Space Bees wearing a miniskirt. Yeah, what he just said, and then uh, on my CU podcast. <laughs> Um, don't say, well, Pat said a video game year is definitely coming back. Uh, there's a chance that we might look at it. It's a wonderful, uh, actually look into Amazon. I'm, I'm, I'm looking at probably the majority of my growth, uh, professionally with Amazon over the next couple of years. Uh, so you had to, the, one of the things that we have to do though, is I think they require closed captioning for Amazon. They do. And that's tough. I'm, I'm doing that right now for the show. Like if you see my stuff, I have a lot of videos right now on Amazon prime and I do have to close caption those, which means I manually have to do them, which I did for like the first 20 just to see if it would isn't, work. Isn't there services online you can hire to do that? Well, I wanted, I wanted to just test it first. Just like, is this even going to work? Am I going to get a video up there? It's, it's a very different, just, just speaking professionally, but also just to those listening who are interested. I've had a lot of people ask me both in the YouTube world and out of the YouTube world, what's it like on, Am you know, on Amazon? It's, it's not, you don't get rich instantly. <laughs> it's like anything else. You're getting very, very tiny, tiny, tiny little, little, chunk, little pennies of things. You know, it depends on your viewership. But what I love about Amazon's model is there's no ad blocker. And they they respond better to quality than than YouTube does. So that would be something better for maybe not Pat the NES Punk videos, or maybe it would it be. It would but be not. better for you because you have at least a concept of production. Oh, thank you. And I was talking. I, I know uh, Lazy Game Reviews was asking me about it. I'm like Clint, same thing. I mean, you you actually have you have an idea of what goes into making a good high quality video. It's a good place for you, like GameSack. Well, I think it's a great place well, for GameSack. What I think is most important, though, is that it's a. I think it's a. It's a, it's a you know, it's a paying audience uh, for Amazon Prime and otherwise. Um, they're not quote unquote what you call the entitled audience. But um, I didn't say this, Pat. This was you. <laughs> but it's a. It's we'll play the tape back. But it's a different audience than YouTube. It is uh, it, the YouTube. The, is there, there is a generational divide. It's not. It's not an insult. You, it, I mean, I, I know people our age are like seriously. What the hell are these kids watching? 
But they look at our stuff like you're a dinosaur. What is this shit? But it's you, at least you know that they paid for Amazon Prime. It's a and much so, old. It's a much yeah. It's a it's an older maybe, audience. But at the same time, they also haven't reached every. You know, I get a lot of email um, messages or emails or whatever from Canadian viewers. Like I'd want to watch it on Amazon Prime, but it's not there. What's up? And I'm like, I don't have control over this, but I'm pretty sure Amazon's looking into global domination. So just hang in there. Oh, they're getting close uh, now. Now uh, you know they bought Twitch uh, a year and a half ago, um, and now. Uh, one of the news news points that came out was now now uh, they're promoting like whenever a streamer is playing a game they're putting a buy this game now yeah. button right there and if you're on Twitch and you're a partner you get like like five percent of the sales uh, from it from that game but you don't have a choice that button's gonna be there hey buy this game probably on Amazon yeah well uh, probably Twitch. no definitely <laughs> yeah like they're integrating they got to make back that whatever they spent a billion dollars on Twitch they're they're, they're an, I like their I like what they've done in in most respects because they're cu- their their system and, and and closed captioning is is um is where you see this first. I mean, what they're doing is they're keeping out the crap, and by crap I mean just the screaming, yelling, ranting, you know, just drama, whatever. Just just somebody like reaction videos, reaction videos, <laughs> just just the, the the junk that people watch on YouTube. And that's but this is what YouTube is is for better for lack of a better term it's what it's good for i mean if you want to just watch some kitten crawl out of a shoe where do you go you go to youtube but if you want to watch like a well-produced show that's informative and maybe has a season and some sort of consistency you go to amazon well i'll look into uh closed captioning my path the nes punk videos uh and we'll see if my alicia dragoon video gets through or i get spanked by a dominatrix alicia, we'll alicia that dragoon that was, that's a cool game yeah i did a review of that it's, it's the only genesis game i did Ever <laughs> review up? You have done on Truxton. I actually have Truxton. Believe it or not, it's within arm's distance because <laughs> uh, I have a few down here. I have a few of the shooters. Oh, it's the first one I grabbed randomly. I swear to God, well, you got the case too. Good man. Okay, Pat. Pat. Pat's legit. Pat's got Truxton I, in his I hand swear to right God. now. I, I swear to God, I, there's a few down here. I think I have uh, Wings of War down here. I have uh, Felios here. Oh, those are all good so, games. So I found Truxton at the swap meet like three and a half years ago. One of the last times I found a good deal on games at the swap meet. I think it was like five bucks only in the box. Really? I know it's, like, it's, oh, it's much it was more like than six, that. Was it a sixty dollar game now? <laughs> I don't know. It goes, yeah, it's like sixty to hundred now, depending on the price. But what's, what's amazing is that Moosh is going up over like four hundred. I've seen on eBay, which is I yeah, think is a big I, I should have got that a few years ago when it was like two hundred bucks or whatever. But, uh, 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 but uh, I'm sorry, early, early, you asked me about the 2015 change. Oh yeah, and actually, what we were just talking about, I think, segues into that. Nice. Uh, in 2015, you know, we, I guess, since 2010 through 2015, it wasn't just classic game room. It was classic game room, and I'd work. I was working with investors. I've been working with for years. Back when I started this stuff, you needed investors because you needed like big equipment and whatnot. Um, and we, we were just getting floored by reaction videos and top ten videos, and it was just it basically had wiped out the entire business model, and, and pretty much overnight, almost like a two year period. Uh, which is pretty quick, and I did. I I was I I really had at that point no choice but to say I'm calling it quits. And the thing with the entertainment industry, I think a lot of people don't realize unless they're in it, is that you don't get knocked down a peg, you get knocked out completely if you don't have like the next rung of the ladder. And I, you know, I've been doing fairly well for a few years there, and then the, like the next rung of the ladder was basically out. <laughs> so that was it. I was like, well, I can write. I mean, I've I've certainly got my experience in writing. I'm gonna I'm just gonna go do real work and support my family and just be done with it it was it was fun while it lasted but you know see ya. and then as i as i said this a lot of the audience came back and just said you know we'll we'll we'll, we'll use patreon or something or kickstarter we'll pay you and pay, i like patreon's model i actually talked to patreon before i uh before i decided to go through with it and i just sort of put my job plans on hold for a few uh a few weeks and uh, launched it on patreon and I I I, th- I thought after I understood once I understood Patreon's model, I was like, well, there's a good chance this will work, and I'm curious to see how well it does because like, I'd had good luck with Kickstarter, um, but it, it did work uh, and quite well. I had a great launch. Um, and, oh, absolutely, and you I've, killed it. And I, a great launch. But the thing with Patreon is that you can't rely on whatever it is that you've brought in the month before. It's always mm-hmm. it's always changing. And in my case, I, I found Patreon to just really be. A, be a bit of a challenge in some respects, but I absolutely love it in other in other ways. So it's 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 um it's a double edged sword for sure. Uh, Patreon doesn't work terribly well. I think Patreon's best for what it was originally designed for, which is if you're an artist starting out, 
and people really want to support you. I think once you get to the point where you're like running a company and, you know, a prof- basically a professional artist at that point, it's a little harder for people to justify like, well, am I, do I really need to give them two bucks a month? I mean, you know, and I just tell people, I guess you don't have to. You hey, can watch the shows you, on YouTube for free, you buy a t-shirt or whatever. Uh, it's okay. You say that, you say that, but the most successful ones I've seen are the ones that are most successful on YouTube already and sort of build it into their business model uh, and sort of integrate it. And then those are the ones you see that do 10000 a month, 5000 a month, and I'm struggling. I say struggling, it sounds bad, but compared to other people, what I'm doing is nothing on Patreon. <laughs> it's nothing. Well, I, I think in my mind... I use Patreon in the way that may, I don't think anybody expects you to use Patreon, which is I look at it like I'm I'm off I'm selling a product and you're paying for it, and it, it's going to be a good product. And if it's not good, you don't have to, you shouldn't pay for it. Um, and, you know I, I mean I, these review I takes takes me like a day and a half to make one of these new the new classic game room style reviews. Uh, I typically, sure. I'll typically shoot two or three of them at once, but it still takes. Uh, it's some serious time to put all the camera angles together and play the game and record the, you know just record it all and just do the production work and the fine tuning. Uh, but it's just it's a it's a wonderful tool and I, I one of the things I like about Patreon is that the people who show up in, in at Patreon to watch to watch my content are like the friendliest group of people and it's it's like totally eliminates all just the nastiness and the negativity and the shit that you're forced to look at on YouTube. I know that really the older people have no tolerance for this. I don't think the younger the younger kids get this. But like the last thing I want to do is go and turn on a video and just watch somebody like, and just like, just just even see a comments field. I just want to watch the video. I don't care what anybody else thinks. Well, just show me the, the lot, video. It's more like Amazon. Well, the percentage of comments is is so low compared to the, the views on the video. It's usually like less than ten percent. It is, but it's like this uh, train wreck that people can't look away from, and I find that it's always influencing something about. It's, it's always influencing them in some way. And as, back in the day, like five years ago, it was always like very positive. People could like talk and comment about the games. And now it's always like just this memes or, or inside jokes or Harambe or I, I do whatever else. I can to not look at it anymore. And I, for the most part, I just turn it off. But you mentioned that your video game years got, you know, like 20,000 views or 30,000 views or something. Just yesterday, I put up this video where I was like, here's my Nintendo Switch, where I turned off my TI-99 with a Game Boy. Mm-hmm. And then right after that, I put up the video. At, I put up a uh, Game Gear review of a soccer game, uh, which was like a normal classic game room review that took some serious time to make. And you know which one got four times the views <laughs> in a day. You know, you, you, you know. But that that's that's the YouTube. It's funny. It's funny that people well, get upset about the very thing that they're doing. Like you click on the thing because it looks interesting. And that's what you're. But you, so you're not rewarding people for making good content. You're rewarding people. For making an interesting icon and you know title, it's it's clickbait. It's just and that's just that's where it's headed. And I I only see it getting worse. So I don't have much. How do you compete against that? If you're so making real content, are you we, can't. Are we endangered species? You and I, um, we're, we're in the same sort of a I think general age range. And uh, are are we not long for this world? Are we going to evolve? Are we going to leave YouTube eventually, or always be? Uh, now I'm going to just always use the metaphor. Just the the one cog in the wheel. <laughs> That's a good metaphor. Um, I I think we're both doing exactly what we should be doing, which is evolving. I mean, if you continue, to, if you can, if you continue to do the same thing, I mean, you, you you're just not going to survive. I mean, you're not twelve, so you, you you can't stand, you can't sit there and scream and yell about something. You can't act like you're a ten year old and get away with it. I mean, I certainly can't. I, mean, I have like white hair now. <laughs> you know, as somebody said the other day, they're like, I put out a picture on Instagram. You know, just just I was out at uh, the museum or something. And they said, "When you don't have a hair, when you don't have a hat on, you look like an adult. Keep wearing the hat <laughs> for the shows." Wow, and I like that. It's like, you know, Jeez. I kind of like wearing like this as I wear these big stupid hats on the show. And I'm like, you know, I I've actually liked looking at that on the screen because I feel like it livens it up. And just reading this guy's comment, which was actually really funny, <laughs> I think he meant it in a good way. It's true. It just it, you know, it's like the show's thing is that I'm just basically this old guy acting like a kid playing 1970s and 80s video games and that's okay you know that's that's the show's thing that's my show's thing I, i'm advising other people in this book i'm writing like find your thing don't just copy whoever's hot right now because the odds of you finding their success are about zero you know if you really like i don't know, just just find something that not everyone else is doing when is your uh when is your book coming out 
Uh, the, ti- it's, uh, the title is still beating around a couple titles, but I'm releasing one on Amazon in March. So by the time my podcast airs, it may already be out. I'm not sure when yours is going up, but I, I will certainly be promoting it. And it's actually a great, it's a, it's a good and look what, at um, both technical things, like a lot of technical information just on everything from low budget filmmaking to high budget filmmaking within the internet sphere. I mean, pretty much everything I would do. Everything is from- it uh, full color? Black and white. What's it? And what's it called? I don't think you said what it's called. It's going to be how to make video game reviews, but there's going to be something else in the title. I'm just not quite there yet. I'm still. I, I before I launch it, I want to firm up, firm up a few things. Okay, so is this a is this an, a physical book or just Kindle or, or digital? It will be physical and Kindle, and I'm publishing this through Amazon. It'll be full color. In fact, I'm so much of it's. It's. I started it actually as a test project for my ups, upcoming console collecting book. Oh, I'm working with a bunch. Um, just, just in, I mean, if you've seen the show lately, you know I'm working with some much higher end, some really high end gear now, and I'm using that for both still and video work. So the still, I mean, still, my background is in art, so uh, the book is really predominantly an art book, but with a, a tremendous amount of just written information and detailed information on how to make stuff, how to market it, how to sell it, how to earn a living, how to make a living on the internet, but. I'm doing a lot of stuff. Actually, a lot of stuff that we're talking about, just diversifying yourself and uh, citing. Ex- it's it's a fun read. I mean, it's me, so I think it's entertaining. <laughs> it could be stupid and irrelevant, but you know, whatever. Well, you see how it does. Uh, how long did, did it take you to write the book? Uh, not not that long because I think I've had this stuff just buzzing around in my head for a while now. So I just basically banged it out, and then I'm doing a lot of layout work right now. Actually, tomorrow morning I'll probably be doing some more layout layout work on it. I'm pretty. I'm pretty Very quick nice. on the layout stuff and the design stuff. I'm pretty, pretty fast at. Yeah, that was actually not the easy part for me. But that by the time I got to that point with my book, I was relieved. I was like, oh, this is nothing compared to what I just went through to write all these reviews and play all these games. Well, I, you have a lot of research like, in your book. Like the, the research, I would not tackle a research book. That's not me. That the, your stuff is like you, you've got a lot of in depth information. I mean, I tend to come at it from more of a visual standpoint and then back it up with like some fun writing and. Because in my opinion, you can always kind of go on the internet and find facts, but to combine that with like a print page and just like some nice photography and stuff, like that's that's something special. And I think like you you've done that well. Like, again, I can't recommend your book highly enough. Oh, thank I you. I wasn't I just being nice when I reviewed it. I really, I, <laughs> I really liked it. I, said, I looked. I was like, I just I just held this thing. I'm like, this uh, is like twenty pounds of of something. What the hell is this? I like opened it up. I'm like, yeah, God, and damn. I, I know. At, I know. At first, I said. Uh, you know, I don't want to do the Super Nintendo book, but then again, I was still going through the pains of finishing up the Nintendo book when I said that. It was like filming a movie, not wanting to do the sequel because you're still filming the original. Um, plus, I had still, still to ship the book and go through that minor horror with the warehouse at first. It was it was not easy shipping it because of the how many they had to get out from the pre-order, the, the thousands. How awesome but, um, are international shipments, by the way, with a book that big? Well, the good news is I don't have to deal with it. Um, that's, but yeah, and then I, I still get complaints every other day. Uh, does it really cost sixty five dollars dollars to ship a book uh, overseas? Yes, it yeah. costs sixty five dollars to ship. Yeah, it does. Uh, <laughs> anything over four pounds overseas because that's just the way it works with international uh, shipping. Then you get to Australia, you know, just, and it's like a thousand dollars. Yeah, it's not. I mean, that's what I feel bad about. But I tell people, hey, if you want to order more than one, the, the cost per book does come down. We're just, you know, it does. Or go digital. You know. Or, or go digital, but yeah. people don't want digital. The The ratio of digital books that I uh, have sold versus uh, physical, easily, you know, 10 to 1 physical I was going to guess 10 to 1. Maybe, fif- maybe 15 to 1. I'm seeing about 10 to 1 to 15 <clears throat> to 1 in my digital versus physical sales on Amazon right now. with Because I've, I've just started relaunching my stuff on Amazon. Uh, Ethel the Cyborg Ninja and Jesus the Cooked Up Chicken. And the, the print books are doing remarkably well, and I'm just... People want the they want the book. Yeah, they, they want, want the real thing. Hold it. I, I, they want to use it as a doorstop or to well, your book, get the you juice out of the plant. You could use your book as a doorstop, or you could you could use it to flatten <laughs> like records or you know squash children or yours. It's a giant book. <laughs> and uh, oh, thank you. Well, thank you for my for that complimenting the size of my book. I guess. I, I, but um, but to get back to one thing, I I, I just want to say. Uh, more more than anything, I, I have to just thank the, those those of you listening on on Patreon um for uh for supporting the show or else it simply would not be here and, and and pat to answer your question yes i was surprised that it was funded to where i needed it to be to really just reboot the thing um and while I've, i think i've i haven't been able to quite re, re um re, repeat that exact launch success it's, it's given me so much it's given me the chance i needed to look at what we do look at what i do 
revitalize your career a bit? Just just to reinvent what it is that Classic Game Room is and how it can continue to deliver my product, you know, my my reviews and just the, the information that I, that I deliver and whatever, the entertainment value, and just survive in, in the era, dealing with what is a huge generational gap, as, as you put it uh, so eloquently. That is well, true. Well, this has been great. Um, anything else you want to plug? Uh, ClassicGameRoom.com, Classic Game Room on YouTube. Uh, you're selling your mugs on your shop, correct? I always see that that Pac-Man looking guy, Namco. Don't sue him on your. Mug. That, no, that's clip art from like the '80s. That's, that's is this, it really? That's this ancient clip art library I've had for years, or maybe the '90s. The '90s. I have a lot of stuff left over from like. I just, I thought you drew that. No, I didn't draw that guy. It's, he, it was um, I saw when I was going through something years ago, and it's just like this beer bubble holding a mug, and I'm like, this is. You know, the funny thing is, it didn't even hit me at the time that it was like. A, sort of looked a bit like Pac-Man because it's yellow and round, but I was just like, I just liked that it was like a beer bubble holding a mug and looked retro. I'm like, well, this fits my image perfectly. Um, and then it just sort of became a bit, a bit of the uh, the icon. But I think other people have sent me pictures over the years around the country, like some beer distributor in the Midwest is using it as their logo, and they're like, you should go sue them. I'm like, no, it's, it's clip art. Don't worry about it. <laughs> it's, it's not mine. Was- I didn't, I didn't make it. It's okay. I'll throw using my comic characters and I'll sue them. But no, <laughs> no it's a bubble. Don't yeah. worry about it. Don't don't poke the bear. You know it's fine. So yeah, it's just a yellow yellow non Pac Man entity. We'll just say, uh, drinking the same color uh, liquid that he is. Well, what pa- I just noticed that. Pat, l- <laughs> let me ask you a couple more questions here before you run. Yeah, I know sure. you've you've actually got a few more podcasts you're doing tonight. Um, I, did, I I know you've been you've been big into podcasting. Can you explain to me? Because I'm actually not like as in tune with this as you are. Uh, uh, what what the real draw? is to podcasting and why people like it so much when it's basically nothing more than rebranded radio. It, 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 that's exactly what it is, except there aren't limits in terms of what you can talk about. There aren't limits in terms of, okay, every 10 minutes we have to cut to an eight-minute commercial. Um, that's why radio is basically dead at this point, if not dying out. I mean, so, uh, satellite radio, which got bigger, I'd say, 10 years ago, that sort of, or even before that, sort of led the way to podcasting. Uh, but I think what when technology got to the point with same with YouTube where we have a new form of entertainment where anyone can buy a seventy dollar microphone and that's really all you need to do a podcast and it's just your talent that pushes the rest of it out there. Yes, you you know you, you can find your uh, hosting account. I use Podbean. What I pay like nine bucks a month on that, whatever it is to host it. But it's the freedom to be your own entertainer, I think, and do what you want, talk about whatever you want. Obviously, it's up to you to find your audience. It's up to you to do your research. Up to, uh, it's up to you to have a personality to be entertaining. Uh, you, the general you, not you, Mark. You're, you're great. But um, <laughs> I, I don't know. Some people would disagree with you, starting with my wife, probably. <laughs> hey, okay. I'll, 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 I'll trade my YouTube subscriber account with you any day. <laughs> anyway, but I think that's what it is. And I, I'm kind of proud just because the podcast is entering uh is coming up to the fourth anniversary already this this what's the podcast called uh, again? summer the completely unnecessary podcast with ian ferguson or the cu podcast uh hashtag on on, on twitter okay. and then i just started my own non-gaming podcast called not so common with pat country which is what where your interview is going to appear okay it'll be, give me a chance to interview youtubers um, because honestly, when I talk to guys like you or Brent Black or Andre Meadows, we end up talking for two hours about YouTube and other stuff. And so it made sense. And just talk about more social and political stuff and maybe the, you know, why it's 70 degrees in Pennsylvania today, you know, stuff like that. <laughs> um, that doesn't necessarily fit with the gaming audience. And I know, uh, YouTube audiences are fickle when it comes to new content suddenly appearing smack dab in their face i, I was They're making prepared for it. i was making fun of pat uh, behind the scenes on twitter the other day when he said he's doing a not gaming podcast and i said pat you're 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 not respecting gamer culture which somebody which somebody yeah. told me once to say you're, you're against gamer culture or something because i was selling you know because god forbid i use patreon or whatever it was and i just i <laughs> i just hold, i can only hold I my know. head and shake and go i don't understand i, I don't understand i, I don't I, get I, it I just want, I went to the gym before this podcast. Does that mean not respecting gamer culture? Like, what is actually does that mean? Like, Who defines what a gamer is? But that's a whole other conversation. But, but, but anyway, podcasting is basically the freedom to do what you want. And as long as you're interesting or people find you interesting, then it's almost like the most – it's not like YouTube where it's based almost at this point solely on algorithms and the length of your upload and how many comments and clicks you get in the first 20 minutes of it being uploaded. Uh, Twitter, for the most part – and podcast is 
the most almost still uh, biggest democracy of, 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 of media you have out there in terms of content, where it's really up to, yes, you get your name out there, but the talent factor. You can be just as talented as someone else on YouTube and do great work, but it doesn't mean no one, anyone's going to ever find your videos. Uh, you know, And that's the same way it's been for the past probably three, four years. So at least for podcasting, I think it's still easy to build up your audience if you're talented enough and you stand out. I think that's one of the reasons why it appealed to me too. And fortunately, in terms of gaming podcasts, I was not on the on the the bottom, you know, the cut on the on the on the in the basement or or, or, or or the bottom floor starting it. But I was I didn't catch up late. Uh, YouTube, I, I probably if even if I started in two thousand seven, I would have been a lot bigger. Um, I think I believe, uh, but I think uh, I'm in a good spot uh, with my podcast. I just do, and I, I and I like doing it. And you said I have a voice for radio. I don't agree, but you know not, I have some experience. Not, here's with the that thing: like just it. talking to you. Not only do you have a good voice for radio, but you're you're like you're quick on your feet in a, in a way that I'm 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 not. I, I tend to take the you know the. So I always feel like I sp I speak like Kirk. Like why are <laughs> we but here? And, you know, you're, you're, you're just very said, punctual and quick. I, I like but, that. That's good. But there, there's something to be said for collecting your thoughts on that speaking before you think which gets me into trouble sometimes as well uh so and especially with with my lady friend uh, so anyway. well doesn't it always pat i mean that, that never changes by the way that's true that's true uh any other questions for me yeah i, I would love I, I would love to pick your brain for like another five or five or ten minutes if you'll let me sure absolutely oh oh you actually thought i had something something to ask right away oh my oh yeah well, I know uh, a lot. A lot of the you know, I, I tend to talk um, Sega and Atari and Vectrex and whatnot a, a lot, and that's that's what I'm most into. But over the past couple of years, certainly since I've been doing Classic Game Room, I have discovered so much enjoyment in the Nintendo library. And I'm not just being nice to Nintendo fanboys like Marcus listening. Um, I'm, I'm I just I, especially the Game Boy library. I've really enjoyed it. Uh, what is it about Nintendo? And I'm not talking about just the rabid fanboyism. I mean, I'm talking about like the old school, like Nintendo and Super Nintendo and like Game Boy and stuff. What is it about Nintendo that makes it so special that clearly has drawn you into it? Well, for me personally, it's the system I grew up with. So while, yes, my, my father did buy us, uh, I think we had the Coleco Telstar Ranger. Oh, you had a Coleco um, Telstar? Oh, Pat's legit. The Ranger, though, the one with the with the gun that would get you shot if you ever pointed at a police <laughs> officer. Um, and that eight. 8D batteries like like it was nothing. <laughs> my, my father did buy the AC adapter. For those kids out there, those Pong clones, for the most part, did not come with AC adapters. You had to buy them separately. Uh, anyway, so that was the first system I had. I did have an IBM XT in 85, but it was the first console I had, and it was the first console almost an entire generation had. Yeah. It was the first console that it was a console that did bring us back from the video game crash of consoles, yes, of North America, yes. Where someone says, well, in Europe, it wasn't a crash. Yes, I understand that. <laughs> but for the vast majority of the video game market, which was North America, um, it was dead consoles. You can walk into a Toys R Us even in the late 80s and find the clear and spin of Atari games for a dollar each. And it makes me sad. Um, um, but it was – it sort of reignited that imagination. and was the first console that really – brought it in terms of uh we can uh, see that guy that looks like a, a a carpenter or then plumber named mario that that looks like a little elf named link it was it was more visual almost not cartoon like but it was just it evolved just enough that you could decipher what was going on in the worlds and you could depict the worlds on atari you really couldn't do that uh, it was a lot harder uh you know was having a, a single pixel in adventure Versus having a character named Link that you can... Okay, that's an iconic-looking character there. Oh, oh, oh um, come now. Those invaders were always invading from the blackness of space. <laughs> Descending but from you, the top of the screen with precision. But just that, that slight technological leap forward allowed establishment of iconic characters and franchises that you couldn't do on Atari. You couldn't really do on Coleco. Uh, ColecoVision. You couldn't do that, but with Nintendo, now you could do it. I, I do remember like like it was yesterday just seeing my friends down the street and as an Atari fanboy I was I was blown away. I mean I just I always tell this story when like I see I saw Super Mario Brothers for the first time and it's like holy shit, what is this? Yes. This is like it's like taking you into another world in the way that Atari didn't because with Atari games you had to use your imagination, which I think a, why a lot of us love 
love Atari is that you're combining these blocks in Yars Revenge with the comic book that they sold you in Yars Revenge and in your mind it's something sure. incredible and it's a good game but with Super Mario Brothers it was like this that's, co- a, that's a living breathing world it was uh, like an High ex- Rules a living breathing world Metroid you know th- that's a living breathing yeah. world to explore it's colorful the closest all these, and, and these colorful, well, maybe not Metroid but these other games they're all colorful and then you have two buttons instead of one. You have a, the revolutionary <laughs> control pad that Nintendo came up with. People forget about that. It started with the Game & Watch, and they brought it over. So all of these, it, it was almost like this is a moment in time that you probably couldn't repeat for. You have a, a semi-new generation of video game players, a, a leap up in technology, at least in North America. Obviously, the Famicom came out in 83. Um, and then they took a shot, and it was a long shot. Uh, you know, test marketed in New Jersey, New York. Uh, stores didn't want to take, didn't want to, they didn't want to take it on. But hey, if you guys want to sell it, you know, sell it. And they did. Howard Phillips being one of the famous people that helped do that. Um, and then it, it took off by, I'd say, by later '86. That's when you know, okay, this is something. This is going to survive and thrive uh, by that point. And then once you hit '87, all bets are off when you have games like uh, Metroid coming out and Legend of Zelda. Uh, then okay, now explosion. Yeah, you know now this is it. This is the, the dominating console for the next four years. I always joke that years. I was the only kid I knew that had an Atari seventy eight hundred Pro system, which which is true. I was the only kid that I knew that had. An, it was probably the only kid in Pennsylvania that had an Atari seventy eight hundred Pro system. But eventually, <laughs> after seeing the NES, did. I had I had to uh, talk my parents into getting one, which I did, and I loved it. I just I played Mega Man back then. Like, I couldn't play Mega Man now to save my life, but I played it, and I think I beat but, it back in the day. <laughs> Like, did you see that, though, when people... I think one person remember tried to comment me, oh, the 7800 was technologically superior to the NES. I was like, uh, really? Can you show me any game that looks anywhere near something like Legend of Zelda on the 7800? Yeah. Or, or, you know what I mean? Or Mega Man? Or, like, anything close? The 7800 and even the Atari computers, in, in, were, they were actually capable of more, but at that time, Atari was in complete freefall and just, they... they, they Things were there's there's a lot of information on this which I, I'm not as familiar with. I could just repeat the technical stuff, but there's reasons why it the stuff on the 7800 was for the most part disappointing, certainly compared to the NES. Yeah, a 7800 to me. I remember my cousin. I'm like, oh, this is a 2600 upgrade. That's why I thought it's like it's one slight step beyond. And by the time the 7800 came out, obviously it was already obsolete. I, I think uh, the 7800 had more potential, but it, it just it wasn't going to happen with Atari at that point because yeah. anybody, I mean, like, where was Konami going to go? Was Konami going to go with the failing game company that was in complete, <laughs> you know, disarray with just horrible management, or were they going to go with the company that's exploding and changing the, you, you know, the answer to this? So. Uh, I, I always loved the Atari 2600 uh, Junior commercials in the late 80s. Uh, under 50 fifty bucks, fifty bucks. I'm thinking to myself, what kid would ask for that versus the NES? No one. And I, I uh, had at that Atari point. T- the Atari 2600 Junior. I, st- I still have my. T- it's, it's, in fact, it's sitting right here next okay. to me. I use it to make the show. If you are eight years old and <laughs> never played a video game before, are you asking for a 2600 Junior to play games that are ten years old or an NES? Come on, Pat. I'm asking for Come a on. Sega Genesis and a Vectrex, and you know this. <laughs> You knew about a Vectrex in the late '80s. No, you knew exactly. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't know about Vectrex until the internet. When I, some, a friend of mine turned me on to one, I was like, "Holy shit! I want this!" And I bought it for like 150 bucks or 200 bucks with a stack of games. It is somebody wanted to buy that from me from the last show I went to from Replay FX for 400. And I was, of course, like joking, like, "No, uh, 100,000." And they didn't think, I, you know, they didn't find that funny. I did, and they walked away from <laughs> me. But, I mean, I, it's it's the best Vectrex I've ever seen. But I got it right before the retro gaming market started to get hot, so it was cheap. Well, certain things got hot at certain times. So Vectrex was pretty much under the radar until, about, I say, about three years ago, where it was like, all right, you can. It's the same way Trevor Graphics went under the radar until about 2011. Master System went under the radar until about, I say, 2012. Um, so I was fortunately always one step ahead, where I was like, <laughs> all right, finish my Turbo Graphics 16 collection 2010. Now it gets hot. Uh, Sega, Sega, Sega Master System got hot for a little bit, then died out. Uh, I never wanted to finish Super Nintendo or N64 or, or Genesis, so I didn't care as much about those. But it's interesting to see the trends of, you know, okay, now people discover the Vectrex, the prices double. People discover this system, the prices double. I got two more questions for you, then I'll let you off the hook because I know you got a busy night with some other podcasting. Uh, and the next question, I'm going to just dovetail right into the one we were talking about. You, you are a collector in that you like to go for complete game systems. It's, it's, 
explain the appeal of that and like what's involved in collecting the entire library of a game system, especially for something like the NES, which has some absurdly expensive games. Well, I- I'm still missing th- three NES games. Um, three? Yeah, three. I can buy them if I want to. It's just I don't want to pay the, the amount of money. I want to get a good deal. I got a good deal on the last one I, I bought. Um, plus, it's, you know, you don't want to... Once you complete it, what's left? Besides really esoteric, strange controllers that I'm in love with. Yeah. Uh, but for the <laughs> NES, there's three systems I have complete sets for. Master System, uh, TurboGrafx-16. I'm missing five CD games. I don't count that versus the Hue cards. And Sega Master System for North America. Those are the three systems I had as a kid. So that makes sense to me. Uh, Super Nintendo, I only had about eight games as a kid. I sort of transitioned into the PC once you got the CD-ROMs and better sound cards. And that blew away any console at the time. Um, so I didn't care about that. Never loved the N64. Uh, Genesis played at my friend's house, never had it. Um, so the appeal to me at the time was it was just a challenge. And plus, when I was doing it, not, you know, not even ten percent of the people were doing it. They are as, as the numbers are they are now. So I can go to the swap meet and may potentially find a rare game. I can go to the swap meet and even four years ago, I still find decent Super Nintendo games or a certain Truxton. You know, before I'd say the cutoff for swap meets starting to dry out was probably two thousand fourteen, the beginning, uh, for sure. Uh, the past three years, I'd say the number of retro game collectors has probably doubled or tripled from where it was before. Um, but it, it, the challenge is a big one, but it's just, at least for me, I always like the knowledge of the games as I as I found them, at least earlier on when I can keep track of them. I try to learn about the games that I bought. Uh, so if there was if I bought 20 games at uh, English Town Flea Market in New Jersey where I shot the first Flea Market Madness, I would play those 20 games when I got them, clean and play them. Be like, oh, this is interesting. I didn't know about this before. Uh, but then it became sort of a building up of, of knowledge, finding about it, out about other games, and it sort of, I don't know, it, it fed into itself, where I want to get more games, learn about more games, play more games. You know, rinse, you know, rinse, you know, uh, rinse, uh, wash, repeat, what? Lather, rinse, repeat. Uh, uh, but that, then, that's uh, called also, Truxton Vectrex, more Truxton. Is that what it is? Okay. <laughs> but basically, and yes, they do look cool displayed on the wall. They do. I have to, I, so you enjoy, but, do you enjoy the games that you've collected? For the most part, yes. I mean, Action 52, not so much. But, you know, it's cool that <laughs> Action 52 exists. It's cool that, you know, it was done by Active Enterprises, this shady company in Florida, trying to cash in on the, on the video game craze, you know, in, in the uh, early 90s. Cheetah Men's an awful idea for a video game, trying to cash in on Ninja Turtles. You know, there's cool stories even for some of these awful games. There are. There are. But you, you, so. you actually get enjoyment. I just, just, you, ha- you like having it. You like having the games, so you don't play them well, every day. You wouldn't. You wouldn't go. I, I have like, like six thousand, seven thousand games. I can't play them every day. Obviously, I, I play like one game, game a day. I wish I could play I, them all every day. There, there's still. I mean, I've played every NES game. I have just because the first NES marathon, we played every NES game. Didn't all beat them like the Mexican Runner just did on Twitch, which took him years. But we played every one for thirty-one hours for at least a couple minutes. So we did that. Um, but yeah, it's tough to keep up. And nowadays, I only. Uh, usually play games if I'm working on a project, writing NES Punk video. I just uh, did the NES Classic Edition uh, review, uh, came out a, a month ago, so I had to replay all 30 games, you know, and then comment on them. So that's just the way it is, though. It's, it's, it became a hobby. It sort of transitioned into a part-time job into now the career. I have basically, up to the year, up to the year 2000, just about all of the North American consoles, minus the you know the Pong clones, I'm probably only missing the Entech Select game if you count that. That's more of a handheld though, anyway. Um, so that doesn't count entirely. I don't have the Entech Select game, uh, and I don't have the oh geez that other handheld with the with that had the rotating mirror um, that had like five games for I can't remember the Entech one. Well, I'm I'm gonna wrap this up now, Pat. I've, Pat. Ha- Pat has another podcast recording to go to this evening, so we're going to wrap this up right now. And Pat, once again, where can people find you and follow you and, and stalk you and listen to your podcast and buy your shirts and all that <laughs> uh, stuff you can, and your book? You can follow me on Twitter at Pat the NES Punk. Also search for me on YouTube. Um, I have my book available at ultimatenes.com. Uh, it's the CU podcast, completely, completely unnecessary podcast on iTunes and also the not-so-common podcast. Uh, podcast not the common rapper just the word common 
Yeah, I should have thought about that. He's going to sue me. And Mark, you're available everywhere as well. Classic Game Room. You, you got a successful YouTube channel. You're one of the people that Ian even looks up to and be like, hey, I, I followed Mark for years. We were kind of bummed. We thought you're leaving, uh, you know, leaving YouTube behind, but I'm glad you, you decided to stay. And uh, yeah, I hope to see you at a convention uh, sometime in my lifetime. We can grab a, a, a beverage of our choosing. As long as I'm choosing, and as long as it's something cold and alcoholic, yeah, we're good. Okay, I t- I, I'm, I'm a big margarita fan, but I'll have a beer. <laughs> I, oh, I, lo- I love margaritas. Don't that, that sounds like a, I, I, I paint myself as such a lush. I'm sitting here drinking water, like being a good family <laughs> man. To, being a good family man tonight. I'm not quite as bad as people think. I, I do not get to live like Charlie Sheen. That's not my life. But we can follow you on at Classic Game Room, correct? Yeah, anywhere classic classic game room is that's that's where I that's where I be at. I, yeah, I didn't phrase that well, but that's yeah. That's where you be at. <laughs> I'm glad you asked the questions. Um, so Pat, thank you. It's been great talking. And actually, let's let's uh, let's talk again soon. We we were talking a bit off record on just like Twitch and changes on YouTube and stuff, but I feel like that could take another hour. So we'll just uh, we'll let Pat go to his next podcast, and I'm I'm going to try to either go to sleep. Or I'm looking right at my Sega Genesis. Now I've got this weird ass Japanese game back here. Which what's it called? Da Da Na, which features a girl riding an ogre wielding a sword. This is like a yeah. I may I might I don't know. It looked pretty cool. I may play that one. Mega Drive game? Cool. On the on the uh, on on the Mega Drive. And uh, Pat, thank you again for uh, having me on your podcast and uh, thank you for showing up. For my podcast, it's like a joint. It's like a dueling podcast. It's, this we, is great. we crossed the podcast streams, and we, we both came out alive. All right, my, Mark. Uh, yeah, Mark. All right, Mark. Take Pat, care. Pat is much better at podcasting than I am. By the way, Pat is very. He's a you are a good radio personality. I'm really impressed. We can talk about my my days of college radio later on next time. All right, have a good night, Mark. We will start some drama soon. That's what the kids like, right? We'll get on Keemstar. All right. We'll t- <laughs> I don't even know what that is. <laughs> All right. We'll talk to you later. See ya. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Mark Bustler. Thanks again for him taking the time to speak to me. If you want to support the podcast, you can like and subscribe on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Podbean, or your podcast service of choice. Leave a comment. That's always great. And of course, spread the word on social media. And if you'd like to support me even more, you can support my Patreon. That's patreon.com slash patcountry. If you want to advertise on this podcast, please contact notsocommon at thepunkeffect.com. We'll see you next week with another guest or my own just insane ramblings. Talk to you then.